Hi, I'm David Goforth with Cooperative Extension Successful Gardener. Today I'm over here at Charlotte with Jack McNeary. Jack, how you doing today? Good morning, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, I've heard your name for a long time. I'm glad mm -hmm. to finally meet you. Uh, you were a successful arborist here in Charlotte with a fairly large uh, tree company for a number of years. Talk with you because you're an expert on canker worms, the fall canker worms. And uh, you told me you would show me the epicenter of where they started. And so uh, we're having a problem in Cabarrus County, or at least a perceived problem with defoliation in Cabarrus County. We've gone into about our third year there, and it's got up into a lot of the residential sections within Concord. And so we're wanting to try to learn a little bit about what we should expect and maybe what we should do over there. To, uh, let's start with a little bit of the history of what uh, went on here. Okay. Um, let's see, Hurricane Q was back in uh, uh, 1989 in September. And we started seeing them shortly after that, and I'm not sure if that had a bearing on them starting, but I believe it was in um, 1992 or thereabouts that it got to be serious. When I first started tracking them and keeping count, I, uh, I didn't realize it would go on for so long, and I would have done things a little bit differently. But nevertheless, uh, I, um, I have a, had a website at the company, and I um, would enter the information. I was mostly interested to know when they were going to come out, because then you could plan. People could plan, companies uh, that might install the traps could plan on, as to when they would uh, install the traps. And um, they don't come out until we have a hard freeze, two or three days, somewhere in the neighborhood of 29 degrees, 27 degrees, or something like that. That was the original reason. Now, for whatever it's worth, uh, we're on Queens Road West right now, and the large trees around here, they're mostly willow oaks. And it started about a mile up on Selwyn Avenue was the first place that I noticed um, a l large trees that were being hammered. And it's rather interesting to me that our typical wind in the springtime is out of the southwest. And so they've moved in this direction. And they've gone up, well, if nothing else, they've gone a little bit off to the side over to Concord because <laughs> I've seen them, I've seen from the highway on I-85 a few years ago, I saw these defoliated trees and I said, they've got canker worm. Right. Uh, I didn't really pick up much of a pattern in Concord except I do think they followed the creeks a little bit the first couple of years, but now they've moved up each year they're moving uphill a little bit mm -hmm. from the creeks on up into uh, where sure people live a little bit more residential. So uh, we probably just guess and we would expect those same areas to be defoliated next year. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. Now, interestingly enough, around Charlotte, there are some parts of Charlotte where that are in the out of the prevailing wind that haven't had a problem at all. And yet it is now, it jumps around, it's jumped around a little bit. I know Gastonia's had a problem. And uh, I think we can see it for a period of time. But yes, uh, you're, you're right. There are certainly things that you can do to, to slow it down. Uh, let's go back and talk a little bit about what the fall canker worm looks like. Uh, what, it's a caterpillar, an inchworm kind of thing. Well, that's true, but it starts off as a wingless female. It can't fly. We're going to talk about the trap in a minute, but the idea is these things uh, end up in the ground and they come out in the fall after a hard freeze and that wingless female will crawl up the tree. And in our, what we do, what we like to do is we like to trap it in a, 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 with a tangle foot on a, which is a sticky stuff on the tar paper is usually what used to be used. And um, then um, if you can stop them going up the tree, they're going to lay up to, I've, I've actually counted as much as 300 eggs in a single patch of eggs. More typically, though, it's closer to 200. But if you think that every insect that goes up that tree can lay 200 eggs, that's a lot of eggs. And in 2000, I believe it was 2006, we had a major defoliation here in that all these trees lost their leaves. I mean, it looked like wintertime. It was absolutely amazing, incredible. Now, uh, once it, it hatches out, uh, what I, I think it's sort of a green one to start with. No, oh, excuse me, when it hatches, uh, it's the ones I've seen have been little teeny green ones, and, and the reason I know that is because the female is trapped on the, uh, the traps, about that big, and it's got sticky stuff on it. So the female's trapped, she puts out a pheromone which attracts the males. So there will be some eggs laid on almost every trap, and you can, a person can spot them rather easily. And I observe that in the springtime, usually in late March, if you look real carefully, you can see these minuscule little teeny green caterpillars. Well, those are baby canker worms, and the same things are starting to feed up in the top. You give them uh, two or three weeks, and you've got 
inchworms, the old common inchworm, which is about so long, and that's what's, and they do a lot of damage. Uh, anyway, it is a small green worm then, and um, once it matures, though, most of what we see are gray, with some kind of faint stripes on them, and uh, occasionally some green ones. Now, in the fall, that uh, wingless female is gray. She has legs, and she, again, crawls up and sticks on the crab. You can't miss it. If you put some sticky stuff out there, you'll catch them. It's just uh, where the will oaks is going to be a problem, but we've seen it move into areas that don't have a lot of will oaks. Yeah, and they, um, they also will feed on a lot of other trees. I've uh, got them listed on my website, but what they do the most damage in, besides your big oak trees, is when they do come down and feed, if you have azaleas or dogwoods or cherry trees, they will just clobber them, eat them up. And of course, women don't, and men too, I guess, don't particularly like to have them parachute down and catching their hair and all. So right. They've got a little them. silk and string or something. They, yeah, they're coming down everywhere. They're related to the silkworm. Right. Uh, now, what's the effect on a tree uh, like this willow oak in your yard here? Uh, does it hurt the tree that much? I think that depends. Um, first of all, we're at an advantage we're in the south because we have about an extra month of growing in the early spring and the leaves stay on the tree about a month later in the fall. So we've got a longer growing season than let's just say a tr same tree in Pennsylvania. And it gives the tree a greater chance to overcome uh, a problem like this. If a tree is healthy and it's defoliated by canker worms, it will put out new leaves shortly thereafter and, they're on, and on, they only feed early in the spring. There's only one generation. So uh, if it's a healthy tree, it'll come back from it. As you said, we've had them for years and years, but the epidemic proportions uh, have created problems. And if it's a weakened tree, it can hurt, especially if it goes on two or three years in a row. Now, y'all have tried aerial spraying in this area. Give me a little bit of the history of that and sort of the results of that. Our first spray was in 1992, and I'm gonna to refer to my notes. Uh, we sprayed 1,600 trees. 1998, we sprayed 6,000 trees. And in 2008, 73,000 trees. So that's a tremendous jump. And tell me a little bit about how effective it was. Well, the first one in, in 1992 wasn't very effective at all. They used a helicopter, by the way. Uh, fixed wing aircraft were used for the others, and um, in 1998 they sprayed twice. Uh, they sprayed at the, uh, initially and then at the first instar, which was about 10 days later. And that was pretty effective. And then in 2008, uh, the 73,000 trees, uh, that, that was uh, effective too. Uh, and whether or not we were on them didn't decline anyway, I'm not sure. They've been going down progressively over the years. And, and normal infestations like this, by the way, collapse on their own. And we've been looking for that, it never has happened. Okay. That's why you got them in Concord. You're saying that banding would probably be uh, the most effective thing a homeowner could do. Oh, but... absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit about the banding process. Sort of what time of the year do you, you start in the, and when you take it off and those kind of things? Okay. Um, Around here, it used to be that we would get a hard freeze right around Thanksgiving, the 25th or thereabouts of November. And that seemed to be the pattern for several years. It's, it's become rather erratic in recent years. A uh, couple of years ago, we didn't get our first insects coming up until, uh, or a hard freeze until late in December, almost January 1st. So um, anyway, you want to get the trap up before the insects start. And uh, commercial companies that do this will put the trap up and then come back and put the tangle foot on later, which is a good idea because the leaves that drop down, if they cover up the trap, get sticky, uh, they're gonna create a bridge and the insects will just walk right over the top of it. So from the homeowner's standpoint, um, I'll tell you what I do. I, I band one tree in my yard to see what's gonna happen because last year, I. The last two years we've had very low infestation and I only put bands up on a single tree because I kind of anticipated this would happen based on what happened the season before. So anyway, I put the trap up and I only put a small band of tanglefoot around it because one, it's just less work, it's easy. And then I, I, I then count the insects as they start to go up. I, I watch the weather very carefully that time of year. And once we get two or three days of a good hard freeze, we can expect them to start. Now, if one goes up and it's three or four days, another one goes up, and then it's three or four more days, and after a week, if you've only got four or five insects in the tree, it's not gonna be much of a problem, probably, so far. <laughs> um, but if they start going up and they 
multiply and you start getting 10 or 20 or 30. Christmas Day, a number of years ago, off this tree here, I took 100 insects off the same day. We have a tree up the street that had 8,000 insects in it. In one year, this tree got 5,000 and some odd insects. So that's a lot. So again, you can figure it out to begin with. Now, assuming it was going to be a bad infestation again, then I'm, I have the, the trap up there and I put a, a slender band on there. Now I can go out and put more tanglefoot on it. Now, the second phase of that is that as the season progresses, you'll get dust, leaves, and in the spring, you'll get tassels that will drop down. And assuming it's a heavy infestation and you have some places where it is heavy, the, the homeowners, uh, somebody needs to go out there and put more tanglefoot on the tree, at least inspect them and see if it's still sticky because it tends to be absorbed by tar paper, ten, tends to lose a little bit of its effectiveness. Now, I, I think I should say at this point that there are other things that can be used besides tar paper. One of the common uh, materials used is called bug barrier. It's a plastic strip that is six inches deep. It comes with a, some batting material which is two inches wide and the idea is you put the batting material up on the tree and then you put this up and the, the, the sticky stuff is on the inside of this so if the insects come up they crawl up underneath it and they're stuck. The dilemma with that is that that's not very much area and if people put it up wrong and if you have a big tree that has a lot of undulations in the trunk it's very easy to get it on lumpy and there are places for the insects to go under it, over it, whatever, through it. And the squirrels like to chew on that stuff too. Um, if it's a low infestation like we've had here in Charlotte, it will work fine. And I would, I would say that's an easy thing for people to use. It's much easier to put on. Um, and actually, uh, we'll look at it in a minute, but uh, I banned this tree. And, and in years past, I've gone ahead and banded the rest of my trees, but I haven't used tar paper. I've used that saran wrap-like stuff because I can put it on the tree in less than a minute and you have to be a little bit more careful about not poking holes in it, but nevertheless, it's a, overall, it's a lot easier to use. Let's look at a couple of the materials okay, here. Sure. Show us those. How about showing me the materials now? If a homeowner wanted to do this themselves, do you, well, first of all, let me ask you, do you recommend that a homeowner does this themselves or would you rather them hire well, your it, former company? <laughs> that's up to them. It's easy enough for a homeowner to do it, and certainly you'll probably save some money. Okay. And what materials do you suggest? Well, there's a common plumbing material that you can buy this time of year. It's a batting material. And you put it up towards the top of the where you're going to put the band. And on this tree, you'll see where the bands have been in years past. And uh, we staple it on with uh, any kind of stapler, but they have to be pretty uh, big staples, half inch anyway, to be able to get all the way through the tar paper and into the tree. You need to be careful, by the way. Take that down where you have these large undulations, which are not pronounced here, but you've got to get enough batting material on there. Sometimes you can stuff it back in from the top after you're done, done there. And then what we use is tar paper, and we're not going to put this all the way around. It can be 9 inches, 12 inches or so in, in uh, width. Staple it on, <clears throat> and the idea is to keep the insects from going up uh, over, over the, getting up in here. So your batting material keeps any insects that go up inside from going any further. I start my, my banding low because that gives me plenty of room to apply it. We actually like it to be about, if it's a heavy infestation, six inches in width by about um, a quarter of an inch deep all the way around the tree, and that'll catch them. Then you need to you know, inspect it somewhat throughout the season. And uh, this is the tangle foot that you're using right here. Right, and, and one container about this size will do about a 24-inch tree. You mind if I oh, look in here? Go ahead. Use an old putty knife and I keep it wrapped up in a new piece of newspaper. So I use the same one every year. Now if you got this stuff on you, is it how does it come off? You have to with difficulty. <laughs> I know gasoline gets it off because I, a lady called me in a panic one day and she says, How do you get it off? And and she said, My grandson ran out and hugged a tree that had a, a band on it, got all stuck in it. <laughs> well it does say mineral oil too oh, here there you go. with uh there help you get go. it off but this is your tangle you foot right and so now you were talking about uh a, a easier way this is where sort of you monitor in tree here you monitor when you get the them coming here you're squashing them on this one uh how do you do your other trees okay and incidentally the city of charlotte requires that the tar paper be used as opposed to any other material oh really yeah and, and tangle foot um this is like saran wrap 
and you put it on and walk around the tree with it and it can go on in probably, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, 40, call it a minute, which is much, much faster than the tar paper. It's a little, once it's on the tree and is, it, you might need a few staples in it too. You will need some staples in it. And when you put the, the sticky stuff on it, the tangle foot, you gotta be a little bit careful because you can puncture it. But it works very well. There are a lot of pictures uh, on the website that show Just trees. Just this with right it. here, without the bat and any bat behind Oh, excuse it. me. Pardon me. You're you right. Do? You have to put the batting. The batting on. goes on. Right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, best so, if it's. I think it's best if it's at the top. Batting there. You don't want to put it like this. Well, actually, you can see through this anyway. They make a green one, which is probably better. But your tar paper and your material like this should go on and hide the batting because it's going to be much more obvious and you don't want okay. that, so do it neatly. So that would go around now and then you put your tangle foot on, on here? On the outside, yeah. Okay, so this would be maybe where it's not quite as critical to catch every one of them perhaps, or oh, no. do you think it does a pretty good job? It does. Now you've got to go around more than once. You need to make this thing nine, inches, nine inches wide so you have enough surface area to put your tangle foot on. Okay. Okay. Well that sounds like a neat quick way to do it. Now, Jack, this uh, band that we've got up here, it will stay up how long? It'll stay up until springtime. It used to be that we told people to take them down in February, the middle of February, because the canker worms had quit migrating up the tree. But as we learned as things went along that uh, the insects, when they hatch in the tree, they, they eat the buds and the very tender leaves and they're still hungry. They will parachute to the ground. They will crawl down the trunk of the tree and in both cases, if they crawl down the trunk of the tree, they're going to get caught. They need to get caught in the, the tangle foot. And if they crawl back up, and I counted a thousand insects once that spring, it was really bad here on this tree going up and getting trapped in the, in the tangle foot. So you're going to decrease the, the infestation, the defoliation in the springtime if you leave it up until after that, which is going to be around, you'd probably take them down in April 15th, 20th, towards the end of the month. Uh, Jack, you've got instructions on all this on your website. Uh, give us the website name. Well, it's jackmcnary.com. Okay, and yeah. you've got a link right there to the canker it's, worm stuff. On the very first page, on the left sidebar, there's a big thing that says you're right to the canker worm site. And that's how you get there. And you've got a lot of the history about the, you've been observing these canker worms for a number of years now. So a long time. Uh, I reckon you're probably the, the expert here in North Carolina. Well, it's very good to meet you today, Jack. Okay. And uh, we'll take a look at your website and uh, hopefully the people in Concord will know a little bit more about canker worms and be ready to deal with them this coming year. Yeah. Wish you luck. Thank you. We have had these canker worms for three years in Cabarrus County and places that were defoliated last year. You may want to consider banning your trees this year or at least banding one tree and monitoring to see if you want to abandon your trees. If you need any more information on the fall canker worms, you can get in touch with me at the office. And until next time, plant and plant for a better world.